Good day. My name is John Heilman, and uh, I am here with you with Karen Andriaki, who uh, you will see here in a little bit. And we are here to do our first module within our language sample analysis program. So uh, the goal of this program is to uh, give ongoing support to get up to speed uh, and to gain some training skills and competence in completing language sample analysis. So this project is a partnership with Appleton Area School District, uh, UWM, UW-Milwaukee, and SALT Software. So I'm from UWM. Uh, Karen Andriaki is from SALT Software. I uh, also want to note that uh, we were fortunate enough to get some funding from the uh, Appleton Area School District Foundation to support this project. So. Uh, if you happen to know anyone on the foundation board, uh, be sure to thank them and just to recognize that this work was funded uh, by them. And that funding is going to support uh, some of the training from uh, Karen with SALT Software. Uh, and then also SALT Software is providing transcription services uh, while we're doing this project. So um, they will be providing transcription for some of the samples that you'll be collecting during the training. Okay, so that's the quick overview. So let's get started. What we're gonna do today, I'm gonna start off talking about uh, a very hot topic, some of the changes to the eligibility law. Then I'll talk a little bit about the purpose of our project and why we're doing this. And then I'm gonna kick it over to Karen, who's going to provide uh, an overview of language sample analysis. Uh, tell you a little bit about what it is, how we view it, how we approach it, and some of the different ways that we can collect language samples. And then we'll talk through the next steps of, of what we're going to do. So, as you're all very aware, I'm sure, there's been a change to the eligibility rule for speech and language, uh, or children who qualify uh, for speech and language impairment. And within the area of language, uh, the rule has changed. And now you see, uh, let me go to my, find my pointer. You'll see, uh, you know, this new rule where you have to show uh, a significant impairment um, in the area of language form content or use um, as evidenced in observation, as well as at least two of these measures, right? Um, and that is different from the old criteria, which was 1.75 standard deviations below the mean. So there's no more 1.75 uh, standard deviations on two tests. And now you have to choose at least two uh, of the, the assessments listed. And you'll see one of the types of assessment is language sample analysis. Um, so, uh, for example, you could give a norm reference test uh, like the CASEL or the SELF or the TOLD, or I'm not endorsing any particular test, but, you know, those types of tests, uh, the PLS, the SELF, what have you, and then also give a language sample, or you could do a language sample and dynamic assessment, or you could do dynamic assessment and a criterion reference assessment. So we are going to uh, be helping understand uh, and, and expand our competence in being able to do these comprehensive assessments. So I'm not an uh, employee of the state of Wisconsin, but as I understand this change, uh, it was done for a couple of different reasons. One is we know that there are a lot of limitations of norm reference tests, right? So um, you know, not all tests, they're not equally valid and reliable. Um, you know, differences across culture aren't always accommodated. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, there's a lot of individual variability and in individuals from culturally and linguistically uh, diverse backgrounds, um, you know, they really uh, can, norm reference tests can really be biased against individuals from those backgrounds. And then the other, so, you know, there's some limitations with norm reference tests. There's some technical reasons why 1.75 on two tests doesn't make sense. Um, there, you know, I, I think 1.75 standard deviations was pretty stringent. Um, so there were probably quite a few kids who 
were having a significant impact uh, in their day-to-day -day lives that weren't getting, uh, weren't able to qualify for services. Uh, and then the big issue is that really trying to put more of a focus on the educational impact of the disorder, right? So getting some of the focus away from the norm reference tests, which have these problems. I mean, they can be really, you know, effective in certain situations, but oftentimes there can be these problems. And then the big problem is that there is a limited focus on the educational impact. So really drawing more focus uh, on completing those assessments that can document, document the educational impact of a disorder, right? So how is this uh, disorder uh, impacting someone's ability to access the curriculum, to have meaningful engagement in the school? That's what we really want to get at. And language sampling, um, we believe, and many others believe who write about it and practitioners and school-based SLPs who use it, believe that you can see the educational impact with language sampling tasks, right? You can see, uh, you know, how is someone doing uh, describing technical processes that they need to do in the classroom? How is someone doing at telling a story, relating past events? Those are things you need to do to have success in your day-to-day -day life. So I also see this as, you know, training specific to language sample analysis, but I also see this as broader training and discussion and conversations about this comprehensive assessment. So language sample analysis, this is, you know, one of the tools that can be used for comprehensive assessment, as I showed. And so once we learn to use language samples as within this comprehensive assessment, you'll hopefully be able to take some of the principles that we learn together in this journey uh, and apply these to other types of assessment, apply these to criterion reference assessments, curriculum-based assessments, dynamic assessments, right? And then once you can apply these basic principles, these underlying principles to those different ass assessments, you'll really be able to document the educational impact of a student's disorder and if we're documenting the impact of the disorder, then we're creating meaningful goals, right? For me, this is where the real power of these, uh, these, this range of assessment tools lies. So if we can document where the breakdowns are for a child and their ability to functionally communicate, aspects where they are uh, having difficulty accessing the curriculum, uh, documenting aspects of their discourse that are really interfering with their ability to participate fully in their day-to-day -day lives. If we can identify those things, then we can create some meaningful goals. And ultimately, what we're interested in is improving students' access and engagement in the classroom and in this educational environment. So what are we doing? What's our approach to training? We're going to take some steps along the way, right? So what we're doing today, this is the first of our series of training uh, module, training videos, training aspects of, uh, of, of each of the modules. So we have the five different modules. This is module one, and this is the training. So this is the independent learning where you're doing this video. We don't have a reading for you, but we have a video for you this week. Uh, and then at the end, we'll discuss the application opportunity. So we have something we want you to do, look at some materials, think about kids on your uh, caseload. And then we're gonna come back and have a group discussion uh, with uh, uh, Karen uh, and, and really talking through some of the issues that we're dealing with and that we're figuring out. Um, we could think of this as a coaching session, okay? So we want this to be interactive. We want to really think about where we're all coming from and work through these problems uh, together as a team. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to learn something from us. Uh, I know that I'm gonna learn something from you, so I appreciate you doing that. So at this point, we're gonna get started. I'm gonna kick it over to Karen and she's gonna take you home the rest of the way. I look forward to working with you throughout this project. Uh, if you ever have any questions or comments or anything, you can always send me an email or give me a call. All right, so here's Karen. Thank you, John. I was just making sure that this was recording and I hope it is. 
Um, thank you all for volunteering to come on this learning journey with us. Um, very excited to have you all here and to be a part of this. I think it's going to be great, and I'm really looking forward to meeting you and getting feedback from you along the way. Um, I'm going to start with a slide called Language Sample Analysis because uh, as a speech pathologist, my favorite thing was always diagnostics, and I loved being the detective and looking into, you know, the pieces of the puzzle and trying to put it all together. And I like the idea of, the, of focusing on the word analysis because what we're doing is, from a language sam sample, we're taking a whole, but we're digging into its parts and what those parts do and how those parts are related to each other. Because a language sample is everything in the system working together, and we're getting to capture that and look at it with a, kind of a fine tooth comb. And I, and I really love thinking about analysis that way, particularly when it relates to language sampling. Our basic definition of language sampling is to collect the sample of language, of spoken language, record it and transcribe it. Um, we're going to analyze it for multiple features, and then we compare it to benchmark data. Um, we use those results because we want to help us with our diagnostic. You know, do we, do we qualify as someone or not? We can use those results to plan for treatment. And we can certainly use those results to monitor progress, which is, I think, a really important part of language sampling that is sometimes forgotten and less utilized. What LSA isn't is listening while taking notes. And why I say that and am adamant about it is because when we are engaged in a language sample with a student, it is our job to be authentic ourselves, to be real, true, um, honest communication partners, to be there, to be present, to be reacting appropriately, to be asking appropriate questions if questions are necessary. If we're not following along, you know, then we won't know that something is not clear. We won't know that reference aren't clear. We need to be... Um, totally focused and there and honest to the situation. I'm just not a fan of note-taking. I'm not saying it can't be done, and I don't think it's terrible to take a jot of a note here and there, but more notes than not is just not a true conversational partner's job. Um, I don't think it's a great idea to just take general impressions from a language sample for the sake of taking general impressions and say anecdotally, you know, here you go, here's what I think. You can get so much more than that from a language sample. And also, if you're taking um, measures, outcomes, from something that's non-verbatim, that's not 100% what the student said, all the ums, the ahs, the pauses, everything, it's not true reporting. You're not giving true data. So we know that real-time transcription is a very common practice, um, I think all too common in my opinion, but I don't think it's best practice, and I don't think, I think you'll learn why it's not best practice very soon, and I think you'll agree. I think there's no doubt you'll agree that, that it's not best practice. Um, what we know about LSA and the use of it is that it is recommended best practice. We hear about it in research all the time. ASHA's practice portal um, says to use language sampling. It's considered the gold standard. And many states require language sampling, not just Wisconsin, um, as part of their diagnostics or assessment tools. Um, most SLPs, they believe in it. They know it's valuable, but a lot don't do it because we all have that PAPSD from learning it in, well, I don't know how they teach it now, but it seems like they're still teaching it the way they used to teach it based on the students I hire. Um, and learning it was not easy, especially if you had to learn it by hand. So it's something people have kind of non-fond memories of. Most people, however, in practice do use some type of language sampling, um, but few do it as I just defined it. Fewer do it, I should say. The state of the state in clinical settings, um, and when I refer to clinical settings, I'm talking about schools here prim primarily, is that, yes, they'll use it, um, language sampling of some kind, no matter the age or grade, um, they use it with bilingual students, however, they're kind of at a loss because we, you know, know that there isn't a lot out there for bilingual students in terms of standardized assessments. So yes, people are more and more coming to us, particularly here at SALT, and saying, what can I do with bilingual students? Um, the issue then becomes, you know, 
do we have to do it in their native language? I don't know, Gujarati, you know, do we, um, do we know from our own impressions, from the outcomes of the sample, whether or not the student is different or disordered or if, if this is a function of EL? And I think what we really have to be more confident about is knowing that um, what those markers of language are in all developmental um, trajectories of language and knowing if what's happening in the student's language is reflective of what's happening um, in their life, if it's impacting their school, but also if they're, will, if they're able to learn and make quick changes when we do therapy. Because bilingual or not, and getting more SLPs who uh, speak many, many different languages is not going to be the answer. It's, it's not going to solve the problem because it's not a doable solve. What we have to be able to do is from language sampling, I think, tr uh, work on our um, clinical impressions, our expertise, and also look at dynamic assessment using what we know from a language sample. If a student can learn quickly with less support, um, you know, with less methods, with less input, you know, they're probably not disordered. It's probably not a language disorder. So we'll talk more about that, I'm sure in other modules, but I just wanted to touch base on that. We also know that in clinical settings there's a lot of variability with language sampling. Um, again, I think I mentioned real-time transcription is probably the most common used technique. Um, by hand analysis comes across my desk all the time, and I've been at SALT, well, I've been doing language sampling since the uh, mid-80s, and I've uh, been working specifically with language sampling um, and salt behind this desk since 2006 or 7, and we hear all the time that, you know, by hand analysis is still being done, and I just wouldn't do it because it's still unreliable. I think we all remember counting M-O-U-M, M-O-U in words, and never getting the same number. You know, you don't even necessarily know how to parse utterances with um, standardized measures as a student unless you're taught really well. So it's very variable in terms of what we're getting for data if you're doing it by hand. Um, and I, you know, last study we, we knew about fewer than 10%. And that's, I'm sure, going up based on what's happening with how many people are coming to me and talking about language sampling, but uh, fewer than 10% were using computerized language sample analysis of any kind. So SALT, what is it? It's systematic analysis of language transcripts. Um, what it does is uses a computer to streamline uh, and I think simplify the process because A, it automates analysis and you're doing no calculations by hand. It's lightning fast in analysis um, and once learned, you won't forget it. Uh, it's like riding a bike. Again, I didn't use it for a number of years between, I think, my first job as a speech path. And then I stayed home with my children, and when I went back a few years later, boom, it was like I'd never not done it. Um, SALT is awesome at looking at multiple domains across semantics, syntax, morphology, prenatics, you know, errors, um, you know, pauses, everything from a language sample can be quantified and described, so it's lovely. And the not, another thing about SALT that's different from any other language sample analysis program is that inside of the program there are databases of typically developing speakers, samples, transcripts, who have done the exact same tasks that we will be asking um, you guys to learn to do, so that you have this data, like a standardized test, to compare your students' performance to. So you really have some nice affirmation and support with numbers and data to show your clinical impressions are probably yeah, spot on. Um, the other thing is, is you can take any kind of language sample. It doesn't have to be one following SALT's protocols. It doesn't have to be a conversation or an expository. It could be a mock interview. It could be preparing for a debate, whatever it is. And you can analyze that language if you've transcribed it independent of a database and get a lot of raw data. Again, great for showing change over time. Um, great for other things that I'll get to later, but what I do want to talk about later is the fact that the transcript itself is a wonderful tool. 
Um, the other thing that SALT does nicely is it has a feature in which you can take two samples, uh, context one, context two, so a uh, story you tell versus a conversation, language one, language two, and compare them. Um, time one, time two, so you can look at the beginning of a semester, at the end of a semester, and say, hey, you know, we've made progress here, but eh, it's not showing here, it's not generalizing here, um, so let's switch uh, up, try something different, and it's really nice data that I think is very helpful, helpful for parents, for students, for IEP meetings. You know, we are a data-driven um, profession, and um, we need to use that data to show ourselves and the students and the families that we are doing our due diligence. Um, why SLPs like our program is because it does standardize the process. So you're given rules and protocols to follow and tips and tools to how to grab these samples from these students to make sure they're authentic to the speaker. We want to always reflect back and say, is this what the student can do? Is this what the student typically does? Did this challenge the student's system enough? If not, let's do it again in a different way or do it again in a similar way on a better day, you know, whatever it is. Also, the transcription part of it, which you guys won't have to do, is very standardized. There are codes and conventions that we use across every language sample that drives the analysis. So there's really not a lot of variability in that, and it also makes it extremely fast. Um, so you, and it also makes it so that you get abundant data, more data than you probably ever need. But when you want it, it's there and it's awesome. Um, SALT also does a great job because of the data and because of the data being so specific, um, giving you strengths and weaknesses. It gives you a profile of uh, spoken language across domains. And you know, you can show a student not just deficits, but or their parents or their teachers, their strengths, and you can build off those strengths. And then you can also use the database, or excuse me, the sample and the snapshot of that language and the performance there to generate really functional, meaningful goals that actually impact their communication, that you're seeing, that you know, you know they're there for a reason, and it's showing up in this sample, and now we have data, and how is that relating to school performance? We always want to look back on educational impact. You know, you can do that with a language sample really well. And we'll talk more about that as we go forward in um, our training and our learning. Uh, monitoring progress, I can't say enough times. You know, people don't think about taking samples for this. Um, they don't have to be long samples, but th it's really nice to know that you have made a change, that something has generalized, or if it hasn't, that we need to pivot. Um, the other thing about language sampling and SALT is that you can use it with anybody who can speak, anybody who can produce language. In fact, I have a colleague, customer, um, someone I'm affiliated with, uh, becoming a friend actually, who has been specifically and focusing all of her time on AAC language samples and SALT. And um, she's getting published and she's got a great practice and she and I are of the mindset that language is language, however it's produced. And language can grow however it's produced, and language can um, be tracked however it's produced. And so we're really excited to see that um, this is a tool to use with kids who use augmentative communication, our alternative and augmentative communication. Also, um, there is a cost-benefit ratio that I think will you'll come to realize that these abundant outcomes and this process that's not very long, it's not, in, it's not as long as you think, um, that that time spent and what you get out of it is really a benefit to you. Uh, the cost is less than the benefit in terms of time and effort. So I think you'll learn that and I think we'll, uh, you'll be excited to know that it's not as scary as it may seem on the front end. Rationale for SALT and computerized language sample analysis. Um, some of this we've touched on. I cannot say enough times how important I think, and I think anybody who does language sampling and all the researchers who use it know that this is an authentic assessment, that it's everyday communication context, it's natural language, it's functional language, it's a snapshot of a, a, a person's whole system, their whole speech language system coming together and, in, and working, and we get to look at that as a whole and see how they've done and if it reflects how they're performing in school or at home or civically or in their job. Um, it's considered best practice. Um, sorry about that. Um, especially when you're looking at kids who are a little different than 
I don't want to say typical, but let's say bilingual kids or kids with a dialect. Um, young kids, kids on the spectrum, they're not always as easy to test. Um, you can even use um, language sampling for written samples, which is nice. And again, it, 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 there's nothing about standardized measures that I would say never use them. I, I think they have their place, but language sampling definitely can augment and often support and sometimes refute what a standardized measure says. Um, language sampling is developmentally sensitive. We know that kids grow and their language grows and they have more vocabulary, more causal density, more complex language, more complex vocabulary through childhood and beyond. And so that's nice to, to show that change over time and to see where a student uh, performs compared to other students that are same age and grade. Again, we talked about reason for referral. You know, if, 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 it's, if a student's being referred, we would hope that we would see that in a language sample. Um, and if we don't, it's, it's either going to be that we have to pivot and try a different kind of sample or it's just not happening like it's being seen in the classroom. And again, it's the detective work that I like. You know, you, it, it, nothing's ever super easy all the time. Most of the time, language sampling does document and substantiate the reason for referral or why someone's in therapy or the changes over time. Um, but if not, we have to look back and say, why? You know, what did we do? What did, did the student have a bad day? Was it the wrong kind of context? You know, did I not establish rapport? Um, did this not challenge their system? Was it too easy? Was it too hard? Um, the other thing I think we talked about is that you can look at all the domains of language at one time, which is really nice. And, um, you know, it's not just the, the microstructure. There's other things. The macrostructure of language can be looked at too. If you take a sample that is a narrative or expository or persuasion, you can look at those elements of story, grammar, or those parts of how to tell a game or sport or how to persuade and find out, you know, if those, if there are one or more parts of that that a student really struggles with or, um, or not. So the Common Core Standards, uh, some states really use them, some states don't care, some districts use them, some districts don't agree with them or don't necessarily need them in their curriculum or follow them. But I will say that if you do follow the Common Core, we at SALT have put together um, a nice way to show you that the outcomes and how they relate to the Common Core and how if you're looking at a specific language or literacy standard, you could look at this measure and see if that can show you some light onto how the student performs. And we have a document that shows it and we can also kind of walk you through that at some point. The other thing is linguistic and cultural bias is on us if we bring that to a language sample. This is one of those uh, assessment tools that just doesn't inherently bring bias. So it's lovely because we don't have a lot of that with standardized tests. Um, we're working on it. The field is aware of it. It's a hot topic. but. Language sampling doesn't have it unless we bring the bias to it. So um, that's a, a bonus with this procedure. Meaningful goals and objectives, I can't say enough. Um, you know, you're looking at real authentic language that is, again, should be relating back to educational performance and com communication impact. So we want to write a goal that's meaningful. Um, we'll use the data from, you know, our language sample and the whole diagnostic and say, you know what? Here's what's happening, here's what we should be doing, and let's see if it's a measurable goal. And typically with a language sample, because you're getting outcomes across the board, you can measure the performance. Again, the same thing with progress monitoring. You've got data, and we are a data-driven uh, uh, field, and parents demand it, schools demand it, we should be producing it, and so we have it now. And also, you may remember that you were taught to elicit a language sample well, you should have been in graduate school, and it was probably some memory that you'd like to forget if you did it by hand, because it's very frustrating. But there are so many ways to teach language sampling now that could eliminate that PTSD. Um, and so I'd like you to forget that, because we'll go forward and, and make it nice and fun. <laughs> the clinical utility, um, again, a little bit of this is redundant, but you know, we can always ask from LSA, does the student meet criteria? And again, Wisconsin's criteria now is asking that you use a language sample, or at least in, in part. So from that, if so, if they're meeting criteria from your assessment, your meaningful assessment, um, then we're gonna write functional goals. We're not gonna write goals that don't relate to what happens in real life communication and in school. If you use 
I would say for a three-year re-eval, you ask yourself, you know, where are we? Did we make progress? And I can't say how many times, you know, before um, I was privy to SALT, you know, people would come to an IEP meeting and, um, you know, kind of spit out stuff, no data, just say, yeah, they're doing better. And again, we are, we are miles farther along than we used to be when I first started. But it is nice to have data and say what the progress is and what we need to do next, and maybe we have to tra change trajectory. Progress monitoring, I think I talked about this. You don't have to use long samples. You can take little short snippets of language and focus on your therapy targets. Um, you know, you can say, I'm working on um, complex syntax, so I want to make sure that the coordinators and subordinators are more advanced. It's not just and, but, and or coordinators, but we're going to have this, we're going to see if this student who we want more clausal compact density in, we want um, to make sure that the language is um, higher order syntax. Let's see if they're using if, until, when, however, there, um, while. And if they're not, or even if they are, this is where the transcript is a beautiful tool. You have taken a sample, you have looked at the transcript, you've got it, you've analyzed it, you can dial in and say, oh my goodness, look what you did here. Here is an excellent use of this um, complex syntax of these clauses. Or here is an excellent use of this vocabulary from science. Or look what happened here. Instead of just saying, and the dog went to the store, you said, while we were shopping, the dog went to the store. Now, I don't know why that just came to my mind, because that would never happen. But you understand the, the example there. Um, you can do anything in a transcript, which is lovely, too. You can go into a transcript and you can code for um, responses to questions. Let's say inappropriate response, appropriate response, off topic, on topic. And you can use that to show a student, hey, here's where, you know, this was a great answer. It was right on, spot on. But here's where, you know, you kind of went off, you know, you went rogue a little bit. Um, you know, you can take those examples and show students success as well as how could we change this a little bit. So it's another good reason to really get a verbatim transcript and a verbatim um, document of what happened in the language sample. Side note, when you do start with a language sample, and I'm not suggesting that everyone does, but I always did and I liked it because A, it built rapport. I got to know the student. Um, it was comfortable and kind of laid back and not this testing situation. And oftentimes what would happen was you'd have such a good amount of data from that that you might not have to give an entire omnibus test or every subtest from like the, the tills or from the self. Um, so in my opinion, it is bang for your buck. If it can eliminate some of that testing pressure and time um, and free me up from something else that I don't need to do and repeat and uh, you know reinvent and do something that I don't need to do because I've already got the information from, a language sample? Good. Great. So SALT is different than other computerized language sampling um, programs, um, and it's widely used because it has databases of filled with uh, speakers' language sample transcripts for which or from which you can compare your students' performance to. So we have both English fluent, um, many many samples of English fluent speakers um, giving play samples or narratory retells or expositions, whatever, you see all the context. And we also have Spanish, English, um, uh, bilingual kids who are native Spanish speakers doing um, the, the story retells and some monolingual Spanish retells samples. And it's really nice to be able to have that benchmark data when you've done your due diligence by following protocol and taking a sample and you know it's authentic to what the student can do and then having it transcribed and go in and say, how did this student look compared to typically developing students doing the same thing who are the same age? Um, it's, it's wonderful to uh, support your, your clinical impressions. Um, it, makes, it allows you to have data, which is lovely to support your clinical impressions. And again, it allows you to look later in time to say, oh, here's the change that's happening, you know, now that we're a little older and now that we've done a little therapy, uh, look what's happened. So, and now we can compare it to this age student doing this context. So, it's like a standardized test. Um, 
it's really nice uh, in that way and it gives us some confidence and some benchmark data and uh, people love the databases. That's not to say that you can't take any kind of sample and get raw data. You can, but the databases are definitely a bonus. Um, elicitation context we're going to learn a lot more about. That's going to be something we focus on a little bit later. But choosing a sampling condition or the context or what kind of language sample you're going to take is a critical step in language sampling analysis. You know, you probably have all been taught to take a, conversa a conversational sample um, because, yes, it's important to know how students who are being assessed uh, do in conversation if that is a problem for them. But the context isn't just conversation. We can take all kinds of samples to discern how a student is performing in, under those conditions for that task. So what we always want to do is ask ourselves, you know, what do we want to learn from the sample? You know, do we want to just look at language, language projection in general? Do we want developmental information? Is there a specific skill that we want to tap into, um, like turn table taking or referencing or cohesion from telling a story? Do we want them to be able to tell how to do something or persuade? So, you know, these these ideas of what we want to find can be related to what we do in terms of eliciting a sample. And we at SALT have made, I think, this an easy task, easier task, because we've done a lot of the work by saying, you know, here are these protocols. If you follow them, A, it's going to be a valid and reliable sample. Um, they're explained in detail. They take some pressure off of us as clinicians because they're scripted for us. We know what to do and we can just kind of ease into focusing on the student instead of all role. And they're really nice. So we'll be looking at this in the next module for sure, and, um, and we're all really excited about that. So let's tie it up. Language sampling is the gold standard. Um, it's listed all over literature as that. Um, I don't know where it came from, but it seems to be a, a truth. For naturalistic, authentic language assessment, and it is required by IDEA, um, so, not language sampling per se, but to get naturalistic language assessment. Um, so, we want to make sure that we keep that in mind. Um, we also have learned that there are all kinds of different ways to do language sampling, um, but not everyone follows the same rules and regulations, or procedures, I should say, not regulations, that we've learned that computerized language sample analysis has a lot of advantages over the by-hand methods. Um, you know, just the data and the reliability and validity and the, the, the speed and the, you know, abundance of measures that come out of it. Um, we know now that SALT is something that you can use for CLSA. Um, it's relevant for school-based speech paths because um, the protocols are sort of honed for school-age kids in SALT. And um, it is user-friendly, and we'll learn about that more as we go on. Um, we know from experience, I know from experience, and Dr. Hellman does as well, that, you know, although language sampling is being used, um, we think it's really important that, um, that the training we do is not just one and done, get in there and motivate people to go, hey, take a language sample and use salt and then see you later. Um, we know that we have to be effective and support you guys along your journey and we're hoping to learn from you on how best to do that so that we can um, implement LSA widespread um, across school districts, have them have support, and do best by our students in that way. So the next steps, um, you're going to be looking at language sample protocols um, from SALT. And you know, you're going to have to think about a student on your caseload for which um, you want to take a language sample or from which and discern you know, what kind of sample you want to do. And then we'll be talking in groups and talking about um, the student and what you want to learn from the student and what context you chose and why, and then we'll collect samples. So thank you very much for listening to me ramble on. Um, like John said, I'm here for questions, comments, anytime, um, and I'm happy to support and be a part of this journey with you guys. Thanks.